What's going on? This is the Saturday Down South podcast. I am Connor O'Gara. Will, after four years, it finally happened. Four years. Yeah, I know. Crazy. Big, big events of this weekend. Um, I tested positive for COVID. Mm. So, Did you like uh, Joe Biden tweet, I am sick? I didn't. I thought that would maybe be in poor taste. Um and you know what? We're still powering through. We're still recording the podcast today. No big deal. Playing hurt. Mm-hmm. Still got radio stuff and whatnot. I'm basically treating it like, yeah, all right, I'm going to stay in my part of the house so as to not get Claire sick. Because as parents know, a child coming home from daycare who is sick and has to be at home while parents work from home is just the worst possible thing. So we're going to try and do what we can there. Um, I was going to tweet that. And then I thought to myself... I'm just doing this for me, and I don't want attention for it, despite the fact that I let off the show with it. Yes, yes. It's very funny because I woke up this morning, kind of thought I had a migraine. I was like, my day is a little bit bad. So today, uh, we might see me and just go become the Mad King and be like, I'm so happy that we got five-star five Patrick Peterson on our team. I might just start saying nonsense as, as it goes on. So this is going to be electric. Yeah, if Will, uh, if you do indeed test positive for COVID, because we were staying at the same Airbnb uh, mm-hmm. last week in Dallas, um, no incorrect takes can be mm-hmm. used against us today. I think we're we are immune in that way. Not immune in like you know from a physical standpoint, but yeah. immune from a standpoint of anything that we say about some dudes today. If you disagree with it, just take a breath. Remember probably one and a half COVID cases that we're talking about here. So at least mm-hmm. one and a half, I would assume. Um, yeah, like 1.5 speed. So we could use this case to just like, I think Cincinnati will make the playoff. Uh, I think Garrett Dustmeyer is going to win the Heisman. And then later we could just cut that stuff up if it works. If not, boom, blame the vid. Done. Exactly. So that, that should be pretty easy. Plan for today, um, our annual Jordan Rogers at SEC Media Days chat. We have that coming up. Plus, we've got Lad of the Week. But first, Will... You got to fill out an all SEC ballot. I'm excited to be able to talk about this. Our biggest preseason all SEC beefs, more so not with each other, but with the way that the ballot came out. If you have the ballot in front of you, the media ballot um, might be a good time to be able to do that if you want to follow along with us. But I think you, I think you said this was your first time filling it out, right? Because you didn't fill it out back in 2016. Yes, I felt unqualified. This time I'm just as unqualified, but I'm more confident. So I'm just going to give my opinion. You know, I, I feel like that's the thing. Like when we kind of talked about it, and it's such an honor to do. And at the same time, like how much is going on? It feels like a lot of the old sky guys. It's kind of like, it's kind of like you with the uh, Heisman in a way, right? It's like you get it your first like five, 10 years. You're like, oh my God, let me get this guy's name right. Let me go to PFF. Da, da, da. And you see the guys that you respect the heck out of. They're just like, uh, how many family guys, Georgia guys? All right, all right let's keep I got a deadline to hit, you know? Exactly. Oh, I, I would like to think I don't just, you know, listen to look at team names when filling out the Heisman ballot, but yeah. you don't exactly. Yeah. 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 Um, some others might not be able to say the same thing. Um, so here's how this process works. And by the way, neither of us voted for Vandy. We're confirmed. I saw Willis ballot. He did not yep. vote for Vandy to win the SEC. Um, the, the way that you fill it out is actually a little bit different than what the average person would probably think. So the way that this sets up, um, you have two quarterbacks, four running backs, four wide receivers, two tight ends, eight off guards slash tackles, two centers, eight defensive linemen, six linebackers, eight defensive backs, two place kickers. You're getting tired because you should be getting tired. Two punters, two return specialists, two kickoff specialists. Yes, kickoff specialists, two long snappers, and then you do your predicted order of finish. Um, Will, you turned off your video, which means I'm assuming you're – really upset oh there we go we got Will oh back. i'm locked in look i got my second screen here because oh, i did the actual go. voting on here look you guys are going to hear my horrible takes live but yes to your point it's like you know we see this stuff guys do do a little like uh Rosillo always talks about this like there are these people that do things by themselves when you get mad at the media from now on okay think to yourself name eight defensive backs in the sec right now don't use google name them all right now and when you think to yourself well my guy's not on the list da 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 Right now, name eight guys. Because exactly. like, that's the thing that was really an empathetic thing for me. It was cool to watch. I was like, oh, yeah. Like, like I was joking with Peyton. I was like, dude, I listed a Vandy guy and zero LSU guys for this. Like, there's there, there are your name recognition guys. There are the guys you've seen live. And then there's some guys you're just like, he seems like a cool gentleman. By the time you get to that, like, number eight, it's like, can I really pick between these guys? 
confession, I admittedly went with Alex McPherson as my mm -hmm. kickoff specialist for the simple fact that the Auburn kicker is currently dealing with irritable bowel syndrome, and mm -hmm. that man needs a dub more than anyone. So I mm -hmm. basically picked someone because he's having pooping issues. That's the only way to fill out a ballot. Everything else, uh, with the exception of probably not, not going to say that I, I – got as deep into the long snapper PFF numbers as our guy, Derek Peterson, who I swear uh, he spent probably five hours on his ballot credit to mm -hmm. Derek. That's how, that's how well versed he is um, in this stuff and how, uh, how thorough he is. But yeah, I, I thought what we could do today is look at some of the biggest gripes that we have, maybe a first team guy that I thought was like a borderline third teamer, vice versa. Mm -hmm. I'm going to be honest though. Will, I don't really have, any major gripes on the offensive side of the ball with the way that this played out with how the voting went. I was glad to see at receiver that love it in Burks at least got third team honors. They were the guys that I had behind Luther burden behind Trey Harris. I figured that Isaiah bond was going to get a lot of love. He wasn't going to get that love from me. I'm not quite as sold on him um, because he's a guy that's got one career game with 80 receiving yards, but I get it. Grave Digger was insanely cool. Mm -hmm. That play is unreal. And now he's at Texas. He's kind of stepping into that role as potentially the go-to. He and Matthew Golden, they have high expectations for. Sark talked about that depth that they have at receiver. And there's an expectation that he will be in line for even more production, more pass-heavy offense. If I had a fifth receiver spot, it would have gone to Kyron Lacey. So no problems with him being a second-team guy. Mm -hmm. um, did you have any major discrepancies at receiver the way that it played out with Kind of, I, I thought it was pretty chalky with with Burden and Harris getting those first two spots. Yeah, it's it's kind of funny, right? Because I feel like receiver and running back were kind of flipped. Which is that, like, okay, I think we're far and away in agreement that like Luther Burden was almost like consensus, like he's just the best receiver coming back in the SEC. Uh, Trey Harris feels like, hey, we like your offense. You may not be like the second best receiver, but you're likely going to end up with probably the second or third best in terms of stats if you stay healthy. Does that make sense? I think he's the second best. Mm -hmm. Even like even with the numbers, almost would have had a thousand yard receiving season. He played like forty five snaps in his first in the first four Ole Miss games because of injuries. And the highlight reel grab that he made against A and M is one of the best catches I've ever seen. Like truly one of the best catches I've ever seen. I, I like Trey Harris a lot, so I, I think he's already at that place where even if it wasn't a projection, I think based on what we've already seen him do, I have no problem with him being right behind Luther Burden as as a first team guy. Yeah, no, and, and I honestly agree with you that because as I'm looking around, it's like there are guys who I like who I think are talented, you know what I'm saying? But a lot of them are in situations where I think statistically they're going to end up. So it's, it's really one of those where it's like double win. You could kind of go safe and go, this, this is a guy who is super talented. Um, Boro's going to go with that. So I think we're aligned there. Uh, but I was going to go with that is like now we have, okay, Etienne and Hunter. So Trevor Etienne, Jarquez Hunter as the running backs. And we talked about this at the time. This is such an interesting place for the SEC to be because these are two kind of like receiving big play, lower carry type of running backs. And Hunter is going to move into bigger, like not exactly a bell cow role, but like more of a, a, a share of the carries. But it's interesting that not have, you know, a Montreal Johnson who we know is going to be that type of bell cow. He was sent to SEC media days and the media were just like, we'd rather have an ETN or a Jarko, Jarko's Hunter who may not have the best stats, but they're going to be awesome and electric. You know, I was surprised how aligned I was with the media voting. We talked about that going in with the running back spot, how mm -hmm. weird it is just to only have, it ended up, we, we were wrong about, I was wrong about Jarquez Hunter being uh, at media days. He, he wasn't at media days. Montreal Johnson was the only SEC running back as yep. a player representative at media days, which is crazy when you consider the history of the position. He was asked about that. And the fact that he wasn't a first team guy is is pretty telling. I had the the order that I that I did for like because you get four running backs. I went Jarquez Hunter, Rocket Sanders, Trevor Etienne, and CJ Baxter. Baxter, the guy that I think is going to lead the SEC in rushing. And then Etienne and Hunter got that, you know, first team from the media. And Sanders and Baxter were second team. Um, if you're wondering why would I have ETN ahead of Montreal Johnson, along with, I guess the consensus media choice, I, it's pretty simple. I watched that backfield for the last two years and I thought that ETN was the better player and I 
haven't really held back mm-hmm. my feelings on that. Radical How concept, yeah. <laughs> yeah, um, sorry. So I, I, I don't really want to overthink that one. I'm like, why would I give Montreal Johnson that nod if I think ETN is better? Um, and I, I think that Hunter is more dangerous than Baxter, or at least he's shown that already in the SEC. But at the same time, I felt okay putting Baxter as a second team guy because while I, I try not to do as much projecting with this, I like to base it on the production that they've already had. Again, he's already had 100 scrimmage yards in a playoff game. Dude did that as an 18-year-old. That's mm-hmm. pretty That's pretty good, especially in a year when you can kind of go all over the place with your running back spots, which is why you actually had Ulysses Bentley the fourth as mm-hmm. as one of your four running backs as well. Was he the, the third or fourth guy for you? Yeah, so for me, let me pull this up. I have uh, all of my – got the documents right here. Okay, cool. So, yeah, I had uh, Bentley third and Montreal Johnson fourth. Um, yeah, and for that reason, like Ulysses Bentley, I would honestly put him in the same category based on what I've seen. He is one of those guys who is a big play guy, who is really elusive, who I want to see him in a little bit more of that role. And, you know, as I just kind of said, Ole Miss is going to have lots of opportunities. We talk about how Lane Kiffin has kind of fooled people over the course of the last several years where he ends up going all the way back to you know Snoop and all those boys, like really running the ball at the goal line, pushing guys around where you see the memes, you see the deep passes, but really it's kind of a smash mouth football team and we've seen that with how he's built in the portal. So yeah, I, I, I really, really like Ulysses Bentley. I think he's going to be great this year. And even, you know, if you're going to bet on that kind of a scat back type guy, he's going to have more bites of the apple because Ole Miss is going to score a ton of points. And you have Parrish coming back. He mm-hmm. did the, the boomerang transfer as Philip Dukes would call it. And then you don't know what the status of Logan Diggs is going to be, how long he's going to be out to start the season. And even if he comes back, what does it look like? So yeah, I think Bentley, if you're, you're kind of buying low on his production, That'd be a good guy to, you know, to, to kind of hype up in the preseason. I didn't think I'd go in this direction. We talked about this right after we submitted ballots. I went with Rocket as a first teamer because I fully acknowledge. Yeah, that's I know. so wild to me, dude. OK, so here's here's kind of the, the explanation for it. Mm-hmm. Last year was a lost year in every way. Like we we know that he couldn't stay healthy. He was dealing with issues all year. How much of it was the weight gain? How much of it wasn't? It was kind of weird to hear the the, the discussion about his weight from Shane Beamer this year, about how he's like 228. And last year, Sam Pittman was at the podium saying, yeah, he's 240 and he's never been faster. It's like, well, which which weight do you want him at? Which which weight is the best for him to be able to, to maximize those abilities at? And what I kept coming back to was that offense was a train wreck last year. And I don't think it was an indictment of Rocket Sanders, the player. I think if he had stayed healthy for an entire season, that offense uh, would have had a better chance to stay afloat, but it was still that bad. And, you know, and by the way, with the Arkansas offense, look at yards per play. Don't look at scoring offense because that mm-hmm. can be skewed by defensive touchdowns and stuff like that. The yards per play metric was the most uh, troubling one to be able to see. And I go back to what Rocket did two years ago, ninth in the country in scrimmage yards. He was a superstar. He was an all-American player. When he was fully healthy, that's when he was last fully healthy. That was the player that he was. So even if he's not going to be that guy at South Carolina, because I think it's fair to be skeptical about their offensive line, what it's going to look like when he steps on the field, he's dealt with injuries throughout the offseason, which has probably hurt some of the buzz, some of the buildup of his potential return to action at at full form. But, you know, I, I wondered... Am I just dinging him because he had an injury riddled season? And if I didn't put him in that conversation, that's what I would have been doing. And I think it's different if we were talking about the position, having more of those established guys, like what Mm -hmm. we saw at receiver where I didn't have juice Wells at one of those spots after he had a lost season last year and say what you will about whether or not he could have come back. But that's because receiver in the sec, I think is more proven and I think it's deeper. So that's kind of the way that I, I went through and kind of thought about giving Rocket that that preseason love. Yeah, I think with Rocket, what scares me about him is that we've already seen him on the team with kind of a bad offensive line at Arkansas. And like the thing about ETN was ETN was on the team with a bad offensive line and he made them better. He elevated like every time he was on the field, he was a safety valve for that team. I think that last year, yeah, Rocket was hurt, but we also kind of saw that 
Uh, I, it's just so easy for me to project what Rocket does with a bad offensive line. And it wasn't great when he was out there. So, and and we've already kind of seen, you know, he's got the injury. They had the quote about like, we've been doing Rocket science all off season. And he hasn't really had a chance to get in the rotation with the guys. So I think he could have a great season. I just think he'll probably be starting off a little bit slow, which could help you in terms of like how it all ends up. But yeah, I just don't have a ton of faith in this offense, you know, going from Bradley, who's a great quarterback to, my boy, you know, this year, I'm not going to say anything negative about him, but at the same time, having that veteran quarterback does elevate your run game because you got to worry about him. And I think the whole defense is going to be keyed in on Rocket this year. South Carolina's offensive line, the the youth that they had to to roll out last year, Shane Beamer talked about how that's going to help him this, that it's going to help that group this year. Uh, TBD, TBD on that, because obviously that's been the biggest area of struggle for South Carolina so far both running the ball and trying to stop the run. So, yeah, I think it's fair to have questions about Rocket. I just kind of looked at the remaining field and was like, man, this guy's already shown, though, yeah. that he can he can be at a really, really high level. Any other offensive gripes? Because I have way more, I think, on the defensive side of the ball. Yeah, no, I think I think this is about it. Offense is pretty straightforward. Okay, defense. Let's talk about Walter Nolan here. Sure. Tremendously talented player. Former number two overall recruit. A big part of the why Ole Miss can bridge the gap conversation. We talked about this when Jesse Simonson came on. Lane deserves a ton of credit for going out and getting Nolan, getting Numan Mielin. Um, and I will continue to praise Ole Miss for that. If Ole Miss is going to win a playoff game or something like that, you feel like the defensive line is going to have a really big say in, in being able to do that. The first half of last year, Walter Nolan was excellent. Mm -hmm. It was confirmation bias through and through. I thought he was becoming that disruptor that many hoped and assumed he would be. Then he gets carted off the field against Tennessee. He surprisingly returns to their next game, which I was like, I think he's going to, maybe he's going to be out for the rest of the year. It was kind of the, one of those devastating injuries. He doesn't miss any games, but he just was not the same player down the stretch. I did not have Walter Nolan as one of my top eight defensive linemen. And mm. he was a first team guy by, by the media. I think he's getting too much of a pass in these conversations because of the recruiting ranking, because of the NFL draft stuff, which I, I totally get. EA Sports had him as the number 26 player in the video game. And hmm. I was like, mm, I'm not doubting him, but with a preseason honor, I'd rather go with guys who have already shown it and who have shown it for more than half of a season of starting to look like the guy. And I'm just not quite there with him, especially when, I do think there is depth on the defensive line. And I think Nick Scorton, I think Landon Jackson would have been more deserving to start off as first team guys. Like mm -hmm. Landon Jackson earned all SEC honors at season's end last year. Okay. Yeah. Surprising return to Arkansas. Thought he was going to do the Drew Sanders thing, go off to the NFL. Um, 13 and a half TFLs was the best player on a very improved Arkansas defense. Remember last year when Arkansas almost beat Bama and Bama was just dying oh, yeah. in the second half of that game? He had 11 tackles. He had three and a half sacks that day. He was awesome. I feel like if Jackson were still at LSU, he's easily a, a first team all SEC guy coming into the year. And Will, I didn't choose this. This is unnecessary. Why have Sorry. we done this? <laughs> Sorry. How much would they tamper to be able to get him back to LSU? That I don't know that we've seen. Have we seen an example of that? It just talked about the boomerang transfer, but mm -hmm. you lose a guy and you say that he's not worth something in the portal and then you tamper by spending X amount of dollars to be able to get him back. You would have been a great example for that, a great candidate. I, we'd have to come up with a new name for that, but uh, mm -hmm. like the, the how do you like me now transfer? Yep. Yep. It's like, <laughs> and, you know, I'm going to get the same back. I'm going to get a contract extension. I'm going to hold out. Like that's the next step. Yeah. Um, yeah, man, I'm with you. I mean, okay, I'll say this, right? So here's what's so crazy about this. I can't actually, I feel, get mad at any of this. Because if you look at, okay, boom, you look at the first, second, third team here, there is a total of one Alabama or Georgia player on the D-line. I, so, I think we got two. I think we got two. I think we have uh, oh, two. Oh, there is a asterisk here. So it gets kind of hard with, like, who plays what position. So, okay, total of two, but there's more slots here because there's some, like, hybrid front seven guys the way they're listening, right? So I'm talking about, like, D-tackles type stuff, right? Because we're talking, uh, like, then again, whatever. But so, so I don't feel like there is a guy who is super overrated who is getting, like, a big, like, balloon, you know, like, 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 like he's super overrated because I don't think it's really even possible to get, like, national media attention at some of these places, just to be real with you. I mean, on first team, 
we have a boy, Deion Walker from Kentucky, right? We have, yeah, Walter Nolan, you know, but that, that comes down to the portal. Like I joked about Caden Proctor did the best thing that you could do. He committed to Bama twice, right? Same thing here. You committed to two SEC teams. You know, you've been in the media. You've been talking to people. People have been following you, keeping up with your daily activity. So, of course, your name is going to be in people's mouths. That's fine. You know, and I think that the fact that Ole Miss can even do that is good for the sport. And then, you know, you, you go down and it's, yeah, it's Arkansas, right? And, and to your point about Landon Jackson, like, I, I hate to be this guy, right, guys, but it's like sometimes, like, for national guys that know your name, you got to win one of the four games. You just got to do it. So I think that coming off of a four-win season, having an Arkansas guy be first team when we have this lack of the big names, the big brands, we don't even have any Texas guys, you know? So after the job, and I know Bo Davis is gone, I know that, but I actually think voters this year were pretty open to kind of looking at the status quo because we talked about it at the time. A guy, uh, Nick Scorton, like we thought he would maybe be left off or left on the third team because he's a transfer coming in from Purdue. So I actually think the voters were decently smart this year. I just think they did a little bit of a prove it with a guy because you just know how it goes. If you win four games again, Landon Jackson might be talked about as an NFL guy, but no one's going to be talking about as, as a great, you know? Yeah, I, I, I totally understand that. And there's definitely brand bias that, that mm-hmm. comes into this. It's almost impossible. I really try and steer clear of that. I do so yeah. much. And that's why we talk about if – Player X were at school. Why? Yep. What would the conversation be? And look, the Nick Scorton thing. Yeah. The fact that he did his damage at Purdue probably has something to do with this. But yep. think about this, man. He played 11 games last year, 15 TFLs, led the Big Ten with 10 sacks as a 19 year old. OK, mm-hmm. I, I went on Tex Ags and I talked about before the voting came out, I talked about how it was pre mad that he was going to be. A, he probably wasn't going to be a first team all SEC guy. Mm-hmm. I am telling anyone who's willing to listen to this. When you watch AM this year, you're going to be like, wait a minute. Who, who is that guy who is winning his matchup every single time? If you told me, Connor, Nick Scorton is going to be the most disruptive SEC defensive player this year, more disruptive even than Harold Perkins or something like that, I would nod in approval. I would say, yep, I could see that happening. Deion Walker is the safest bet to be that guy. But I don't think that Nick Scorton is very far behind, especially when you consider the history of Mike Elko and defensive lineman. Like that's mm-hmm. that that's to me, I'm like, that guy's gonna be put in spots to succeed. That's the strength of that AM roster right now. Another thing, and this is something you just were kind of hitting on. Mm-hmm. Prince Lee Uman Mielin, aka Florida's only all SEC selection on the defensive side the last three years, he should have been at least a second team guy after transferring to Ole Miss. And I mm-hmm. wonder in a weird way. If because Ole Miss suddenly has depth on the defensive line, it kind of hurt him. But this is somebody with 21 and a half TFLs the last two seasons. He was a second team all SEC guy at season's end last year. It's like, what are we doing by putting him as a third team guy coming into this year? Here's a wild thought. And this this tells you a lot, at least about preseason conversations, including Jared Ivey, Walter Nolan as well. Ole Miss has three preseason all SEC guys on the defensive line. Mm-hmm. That is as many as Georgia and Bama combined. Yep. Wild. Very, yep. very weird. To see. And you can kind of get into like, all right, you know, Michael Williams hey, he gets put at linebacker. So I guess that hurts Georgia a little bit there. He's how much how much difference is, is his position as an edge guy going to be compared to, you know, some of these others. TBD on that. But, man, that alone kind of lets you know why we're talking about Ole Miss this way, why Lane is so excited about that group. Yeah, and I, I joked with you like when I was doing my my ballot, I was like, okay, so I think how this is works, how this works is right. You na- you name a bunch of Bama guys, name a bunch of Georgia guys, then you get upset when they don't live up to your expectations, right? That's exactly where Ole Miss is this year. Everybody knows the guys' names. They're voting for the guys, building Ole Miss up, building Ole Miss up. So I'm excited for it to see Lane with expectations. Honestly, if Ole Miss finishes the season with two or three All SEC guys in the defensive line, this will have worked. Things will yep. have gone really, really well. Mm-hmm. All right, let's get to the biggest discrepancy. We were texting about this yesterday, Will. Oh, wait, really quick before you say that too. This reminds me of one of those like social media charts of like when people like tune out of your videos, right? So it's it's so it's so funny because you made the point about uh, Scorton. It's like, okay, well, he played most of his football kind of in the dark, right? Whereas like you look at a guy like Proctor, it's like, okay, like I said, he goes Bama to Bama basically. All right, you look at going from, uh, going from Purdue to A&M. Okay, that's like one way, but it's, it's kind of funny that you can see how – yeah, okay, like 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 Walter Nolan, like I said, he goes from A and M to Ole Miss. 
two brands you've heard of. So that's that's kind of my only point. I know I know that we've already kind of hit on it, but like it's so interesting how like if you look up and down the first, second, third teams, it really just is name recognition, especially with the O line, D line, like Hog Molly type guys. Like I said, like you know, Emory Jones from LSU is on second team, and he's in there with the tackle I just talked about. I'm gonna say his name again, but one of these guys is gonna be a first round draft pick this year if he stays healthy. The other guy has not played on a good line and has only played for one year. So like, that's all I'm saying is that like, it's actually pretty remarkable that with all these new guys coming in, number one, think about, like I said, think about the amount of Texas and Oklahoma questions. The fact that this ballot wasn't just full of Texas and Oklahoma with people just kind of eyes glazing over being like Texas playoff, uh, coming back, Sarkeesian, hook them. Like that's actually pretty impressive. I'll be honest. Remembering that Bo Davis is not there and not going, we can correct for two more Texas D lines. Who can I click on? Pretty cool. I still think Texas got a lot of love I, just oh, yeah. overall in, sure. in the preseason poll. And, you know, it would have been weird if uh, guys like Stutzman and Bowman for Oklahoma were left off preseason first team or something like that. That didn't necessarily mm-hmm. happen. I actually think the media did a pretty good job of acknowledging newcomers into the SEC and not saying, oh, well, you know what? This guy is, is going to be a starter this year. He's a former five-star, and he gets more love than this guy. Um, I You know, I, I think there were very few instances of that. Mm-hmm. Major Burns. Major Burns, Will. Preseason. I tried to tell y'all. This is, I tried to tell y'all. <laughs> he gets preseason all SEC honors. Second team, by the way. <laughs> and CJ Taylor gets nothing. <laughs> we call that one. I told you this. I said it at the top. I should have kind of kept that close to the best. Peyton, my boy, the chef, texts me at like 1 a.m. when he got done with his shift. He goes, why do you not like LSU's defense this year? I said, I just got done voting for a Vandy DB over our three guys listed on the All-SEC ballot. And it turns out I was the only one who did that, apparently. Because, like you said, C.J. Taylor is way better than the three LSU guys, Zy Alexander, uh, Jordan Gilbert, for some reason. And then Major Burns. We have watched Major Burns play enough football to understand that he is closer to working with you than he is at being in the NFL. He's closer to a linebacker than a DB. I'm just not sure why he, we're building him up to tear him down. You see this man running a cover three, and you're going to be disappointed. I think, <laughs> look, I hope the best for Major Burns, okay? Hope yeah. the best. Hope his unfortunate last name for a defensive back isn't a punching bag once again. I don't think there's a single thing that Major Burns does better than C.J. Taylor. And yeah. I think – We've already seen that. I don't even think that that Major Burns dresses better than C.J. Taylor after seeing Taylor at SEC Media Days. Looked pretty good. Definitely in the conversation for best dress. Maybe Burns does a better brisket or something, but that last name kind of suggests it's more of the Lincoln Riley variety of brisket. Yeah, he's he's used to getting flambéed, slow roasted, so I feel like brisket's up his alley. Yikes, man. Um, look, take PFF grades for what they are, okay? Oh, <laughs> take them for what they are, Will. I don't think they're gospel. They provide some context. I don't think that's all you can default to. But here's your major Burns context. There were 52 qualified SEC safeties last year in terms of snap count. Burns' coverage grade was 51st. Yeah. So that's not great. Not ideal. Makes a lot of sense as to why LSU secondary was such a doormat last year. Um, I look when you have to when you have 50 safeties available just in the league we're not talking FBS and you have to do the extend to, to see 50 more <laughs> not yeah. ideal not ideal man um if yeah, CJ, I mean, good if CJ Taylor were at Bama he's a preseason first team all SEC guy there's no doubt yeah, it's unfortunate that this really just does reinforce like Man, please transfer. Like, I hate I hate to say it, but, like, if you're getting, like, as much as we love and I've gone on, like, walk the plank for these guys that have stayed with their school, this is the one where I'm just like, man, I'm sure your mom loves the education you're getting here at Vanderbilt University, but you're kind of at this point costing yourself money because, like, Major Burns, like I said, like, it's just not even worth it. Imagine how Mark Barron was, but make him small. And that is a guy who had to play linebacker in the NFL because he was too big and hit too hard and couldn't cover. This is not even a guy who will have to change positions to play in the NFL. I don't even know if he'd be a good linebacker now. Like he should have changed positions and played like a star role or like one of those like blitzing safeties because I I can't trust him to stop a nosebleed. He's like 23. Yeah. Okay. Look, I'll I'll stop digging at at major burns and I'll just say this is more my love for CJ Taylor. For sure. For sure. For sure. I had him ahead of Malachi Moore. Okay, mm. 
I look, Malachi Moore has been a nice player. He has been. I thought after how good he was as a true freshman that he'd be better at this point. I look, and I think some of this too, mm-hmm. I, I'm a little bit skeptical on how that position change is going to go. He was playing more of that star position. Now he's going to be in a more traditional safety spot, new defense. I don't expect him to be Brian Branch 2.0 because Brian Branch mm-hmm. was awesome. I think it's pretty telling that he didn't move to he didn't get moved to play a traditional corner spot with all of those questions in the secondary. Remember, Nick Saban himself is skeptical of Bama because of that secondary. This isn't like Georgia with Malachi Starks and all these new pieces around him, where the new pieces around him are a bit more trustworthy because of how impactful Malachi Starks is over the top, and you feel like those guys are really going to be able to get help. I don't know that Malachi Moore makes everybody better, and I'm just not fully there with him. He has yet to earn an All-SEC honor at season's end, despite the fact that he was you know, an all-freshman guy in the conference a few, a few years ago. But he gets the preseason love because he's one of the guys who stayed. He was captain last year. He's captain mm-hmm. this year. I fully get it. But if there's like a Bama bias thing with him, uh, I look, I think it's kind of fair to, to point that out. Good player, but worthy of the love that he's getting coming into this season. I don't think so. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm I'm right there with you. I think I think you're exactly right. Like, let's just hype up CJ Taylor, and if you find your your team playing Vandy, you know, I won't ask anyone to go watch Vandy tape on their own, but like, definitely just watch that guy on defense because yeah, I, I think there's there's that's the thing is even in like quote unquote a down year in the SEC where everyone's kind of trying to scout the other new teams, figure everything out. It's still a decently deep BV class. There haven't been like the number of stars at the top that we're used to, but it feels like give it two or three years and we'll be right back there. If that makes sense. I think there have been stars at corner. Yeah. So probably more so than safety. Um, and, and that's just kind of the way that the NFL is now. You can go the entire first round without having a safety picked. I mean, that's just that's become par for the course. Those smash, smash yeah. mouth over the top safeties just are a bit more of a thing of the past. I would expect Malachi Starks to change that for the SEC. But, yeah, it does feel like that it is a bit more corner heavy. Anything Maxwell else? as well, just fire. I, I feel like he's a guy that's like correctly getting – uh, a good amount of buzz coming in the first team. It's like that's that's one of the things that's kind of underrated where you see Stoops kind of having these uh, – usually has a great edge rusher, can usually get like a, a run stopper, and can get like an old school number one corner. Like that's been the good Stoops teams have kind of those three things. We can kind of see that. It's, it's weird that he almost – uh, I might be missing an edge rusher, but I know he has the DT. I know he has the number one corner. So this could actually be a pretty fun Kentucky defense. I'm actually – not quite as high on Harrison. Um, okay. I wonder how many people looked at interception totals because he's really mm-hmm. good at that. Right. And I kind of was following some of the comments that Stoops would make about him and how he's a little bit more of a work in progress last year. Mm-hmm. And that to me suggested that he wasn't necessarily as maybe as, as good as what some of those interception numbers were suggesting, but still a good player. And if a guy like that is getting preseason all SEC love at Kentucky, then you know you're doing something right you absolutely are yeah i think like watching that offense as a fan made me kind of like it it was like a very low nails on the chalkboard feel because it felt like they're always right there always right there but they could never fully turn it around so i think that like if they put it feels like he would be like a a do a guy who would do well in bigger situations you know what i'm saying like getting a guy like one-on-one stuff like that because it feels like he has these highlights but it's not consistent i think that if the team kind of puts things together in a way that's not like always, always, always trying to lean on the defense because on third down, like somebody just falls down or, you know what I'm saying? Like, I feel like if he was more locked in, he's shown flashes of being that guy. He just hasn't done it consistently. Kind of like, oh boy, that was at Georgia. Can't think of his name. Went super high. It was a freshman that played early and then he kind of put it together for the SC championship. Yeah. The, uh, the, the ability to, to, for Kentucky to have like a, a not so, defense oriented team this year is going to be a popular topic of conversation with Bush Hamden taking over the offense. Okay. Yep. Order of finish. Will. Um, I actually had the same one through five and 11 through 16 as the media vote. Um, mm-hmm. Georgia one, Texas two, Bama three, Ole Miss four, LSU five, and then Kentucky 11, Florida 12, South Carolina 13, Arkansas 14, Mississippi state 15, Vandy 16. That probably means bad news for teams one through five and good news for teams 11 through 16, um, if I'm guessing. Real quick, picking one through 16 now and seeing double digits next to your team has to feel so bad. <laughs> I, I, I know it's not really that different, but Hayes wrote about this a year ago for us. And being picked to finish third or fourth in your division, if you're like picked to finish fourth in the East or something, 
and you get some of that dark horse division buzz as opposed to looking at that order of finish prediction and going, wait a minute, we're being picked to finish 12th, 13th. You just, you feel so far away. I don't know. Just looking at that. I I wonder how that's going to impact the way that athletic directors are talking about coaches and job security. If you're, if you're not even in the top half of this conference coming into this season, and, and and like what kind of roster are you putting together? Why are preseason expectations so low? Is that impacting season ticket sales? A- everything that, that goes into that. I just I thought that was worth mentioning in this new world of a 16 team SEC in which we're predicting order finish as opposed to doing this by divisions. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's you know, we've hit on it kind of over and over again. It's like if we could use this, yeah, we we've we tried to use the platform for good in other more impactful ways, but if you could just say, hey guys, like the goal used to be make the conference championship, win your division, have a chance to like compete for all the stuff, everything goes right. Now it's like, hey, being that third, fourth, fifth, even sixth team in the SEC is going to be good enough for plenty of programs because it's all about the playoff. It's all about for surviving another day. Like It's going to take a couple of years to adjust to that to say, okay, well, we might have this super impressive Georgia-Texas SEC championship, and then Ole Miss with two losses sneaks in, gets a little bit of an easier path, catches someone slipping, and then boom, none of that matters. So, yeah, I, I think that – it's nuts all this happening at one time because exactly to your point it's like yeah if you're at kentucky or auburn and you're predicted or let me like go down here and actually like read this out yeah if you're auburn kentucky florida you're paying your coach a ton of money you're getting these transfers you're like selling the program you know what i'm saying it's like yo we have a 10 next to our name like we're not even close it's like yeah dude the difference is actually still about a game or two just depending on okay is there an injury is does the ball bounce weird so when we see this stuff play out it's gonna be fascinating dude because we could i mean in real life it'll be team who's fifth is not that far off from team who's 10th and one coach is gonna feel like super safe and one coach is gonna feel like oh my gosh i'm out of here i'm fifth what am i doing it's a good point it's kind of how i feel like it played out with um my mizzou prediction compared to Mm -hmm. the media prediction it's gonna sound worse than it actually is so mizzou fans don't get my mentions I have Mizzou finishing ninth, which on the surface looks really bad for a team that could start off in the top 10 of the AP poll, a team that should start off in the top 10 of the AP poll, and the media has them finishing sixth. And that's really a difference between going five and three in SEC play versus going four and four. It's not Mm -hmm. much. It it really is not. And I get it, favorable schedule, but I'm, you know, I've talked about this throughout the offseason. Mizzou defense, uh, very skeptical, very skeptical that Corey Batoon is going to be able to take over that unit and keep them afloat just in year one, maybe year two, it's a little bit different, but with, with the guys that they have returning, just a little bit more of an eyebrow raise there. And so like you look at that and you think, oh my gosh, you're, you're totally like down on Mizzou. It's like, no, you actually, you're talking about the difference between probably going nine and three versus eight and four with the way that yeah. standings break down. Yeah, too. And it's, it's interesting with a team like Mizzou, right? Cause I'm, Makes a lot of sense, right? The guys that you know, right? The Brady Cooks, the Luther Burdens, the Boy Weiss, they're all still there, right? But then you lose your DC. You lose a lot of your impact players on defense, right? Kind of an, a little bit of an older defense too. So, yeah, it, it has people scratching their head. And I think that what this turns into, we've already you know hit on this a little bit, is that schedule reveals are going to become a much bigger deal going forward, right? Because it only used to be a couple of games here and there. Like, oh, my gosh, we got a kickoff classic. It's Duke instead of Clemson oh man that really matters like that's actually going to swing our season that we have we have an easier team like whatever Virginia Tech now it's like when the schedules come out exactly to you in our point it's like yo we could have a two eight win teams where 180 is stoked if you're Arkansas and 180 is furious if you're even like an Auburn in a couple of years it's like no this really just comes down to who you scheduled at a conference who you got unlucky with your draw so I think that every year we're going to see lots of attempts at uh I don't know can you tamper with SEC schedule because I think it's going to matter more than more more and more as time goes on. No, I don't think you can actually tamper with that. It's <laughs> going to be pretty regulated. It's just mm-hmm. going to be the timing of the way that this breaks down. And I, I think, though, the preseason expectations for a program like Mizzou, because we feel like the schedule is so favorable, to say that they could only go four and four in conference play, mm-hmm. I think Mizzou fans would be very disappointed with that, with mm-hmm. with what they return on, on the offensive side of the ball. So it does definitely shape perception, whereas – if Mizzou had Florida schedule coming into the year, and if you told a Mizzou fan, "Hey, you're actually going to get to eight and four. It's going to be a four and four season SEC play," they'd be like, "Okay, that's a, that's not terrible, all things considered, but <laughs> yeah. it could be a whole lot worse." 
Um, okay, so I have that one. And then uh, I have Auburn eighth. The media has Auburn at 10th. Again, that's maybe the difference between one game. And then Oklahoma at six. The media has Oklahoma middle of the pack at eighth. Um, did you have any big discrepancies with your, your order of finish compared to, compared to the media voting? Uh, this will shock you. I don't think Alabama is the third best team in the SEC. Where'd you have Bama uh, I, I had them. I, well, funny enough, I actually had LSU at sixth, and the media had them at fifth, so it's not like I'm a homer. I have uh, Georgia, Texas, Ole Miss, Oklahoma, Alabama, LSU. Ooh. Uh, I, think, I, yeah, I think Oklahoma is going to be better than people think. I know their schedule is a little bit hard, but like I said, it, it's just, it just comes down to continuity. Like it's, I did lots of talking with like the AL.com guys and just thinking about like, Again, that's what I've said over and over again. It's a conundrum. It's not something It's not something I'm falling back on using the excuse. It's the fact of, tell me what was wrong with this team last year in a way that does not insult Nick Saban, and then tell me how DeBoer is going to fix it in a way that you know makes sense, right? And so I think if it's not some type of a learning curve from the greatest coach of all time, it's much more confusing. <laughs> it's all the same. <laughs> yeah, I think, you know, we've, we've talked about this throughout the offseason. I think it's perfectly fair to say Alabama's defense will regress. It'd be mm-hmm. stunning if that group did not regress. It's just how much I also in the same breath think it's very fair to say, I think the Alabama offense will be better. Yeah. I think it's just a question of how much better. How their much offensive will they line progress? Can't be worse. Like you their offensive can't. line will be night and day different because of Burles for no line. Chris, they brought in. If you snap the football correctly, <laughs> You will dude, be and talking to the guys, like, we joke about that. Like, oh, yeah, they couldn't snap the football. They were like, no, dude, they couldn't snap the football. Like, that was a big problem. I don't understand how it lasted that long. Like, Doug Marone, whatever. I'm like, oh, wait, that wasn't, like, I thought that was a meme. Like, you guys really, that is going to change how you play football. Okay. Yeah, crazy concept. <laughs> yeah. Last time, last four times, rather, that Bama wasn't picked to win the SEC, won the SEC, Three of those times made it to a na- – or three of those times won a national championship. The only time it didn't win a national championship of those four was this past year. Still got to the playoff semifinal. Uh, the last time that Bama wasn't picked to win the SEC and it failed to win the SEC was 2008. My freshman year of college before Saban won his first title at Bama. So, <sighs> yep. Yeah, I mean, hey, it's up to Texas and Georgia – Two teams that have historically always done big and good spots. So, or good, done good and big spots. It's my first mess up so far. Wow. Well, there might be something else. But anyway, so, um, yeah, good. hey, no pressure on you guys, right, to, to buck that trade in 2008. It's, look, LSU messed it up last year. It's not our problem. Nobody thinks we're going to win the SEC this year. So, Texas, Georgia, it's, it's up to you guys. Have fun. I was wondering if we were going to get more Texas love with the, the order of finish, if it was going to be closer for Texas to, to win the SEC. I think that's a – a relatively popular thing to say in the preseason because of the schedule, the way that it sets up is super favorable. And it was not Georgia got 165 first place votes. Texas got 27 Bama, 12 Ole Miss four, Vandy two, of course, LSU two and South Carolina one. The fact that it wasn't closer between Georgia and Texas, man, I, we have we have turned such a corner with preseason conversations with Georgia. We we truly have, and I don't know that it, it means that Georgia is just able to rise above all of this, but it is crazy how once upon a time that would be considered the kiss of death. I am not talking about it as a kiss of death, and probably because I picked Georgia to win the SEC, I picked Georgia to win a national championship, but that conversation feels very much. Like it's on, like it's on the back burner. I do wonder if Texas and Bama had played down to the wire last year. Mm-hmm. Is Bama getting more more preseason love? You know, I like just the fact that that was Saban's worst home loss that he had. Like I, you know, the, the replacing Saban is was always going to shape perception, of course, with Bama and, and being picked to win the SEC. But um, I just thought that was that was a little bit surprising. I, I expected. A little bit more. Uh, I didn't expect Georgia to run away with it that much as the SEC champ. So I don't know what these usually look like. Like I would like to see like a Big Ten version, right? Where like ninety percent of people have Ohio State. Because I would say this is actually decently like pretty even, just in terms of like it feels like the first tier is hard to separate from. Like yeah, it's Texas and Georgia, but then that next tier is actually pretty deep. So it doesn't feel like there are like two that are above everyone. I don't see a huge dip. It was like three hundred points, however they do that, but. 
like like you really don't start to get into those two and three hundred like like ch- differences till you get to like Texas A and M to Auburn type vibe. So I actually think it feels pretty wide open when you consider what other conferences are doing. I don't know. Maybe maybe it will be. Maybe this divisionless SEC will create for a Oof. a much more open race to to the SEC championship. All right. Let's kick it to our guy, Jordan Rogers. Great to catch up with him. A lot of conversation about all things quarterbacks, like always, a bunch of other things with Jordan. So here is Jordan Rogers. All right, now excited to be joined by a very special guest. It is a guy that used to be my second favorite Vandy quarterback. He is now my first favorite quarterback because I thought about it. I'm like, you know, I don't think Jay Cutler has provided me the joy that you have number one Vandy quarterback in my power rankings. Love that. Hey, I feel like Jay just kind of went off the map. You know, he's more of like a just wants to be off the grid kind of guy now. And you're very much on the grid. Yeah. I feel like you are, you probably have to debate whether or not you want to post a certain amount on social media and stuff just because when you've got like over a million Instagram followers and like, you know, you get the you know the advertising deals you probably have to find yourself dialing it back which i imagine that's just the best problem to have i just honestly i don't like social media greg mcelroy told me this a couple days ago he quit it he hasn't been doing it like for the last like months and i'm sincerely so jealous if i didn't have to and i'm very grateful for social media and, and like aspects of it but if i didn't have to do it i would love to not do it i saw on social media your top eight quarterbacks i have how do you feel about that I feel good. Um, I feel like it was too controversial. Like, I don't, you know, like, I feel like the first three or four, they're kind of like, you know, those guys are me at the top. And I feel like the next, like, five or six, like, you could go any which way, and I feel like you could justify it. So I don't think I ruffled too many feathers if you're not in Knoxville. You have Wigman at five. You have him higher than anybody that I've seen. I thought I was the biggest Connor Wigman fan because I think I had him at six in my first, in my first quarterback rankings, and you had him at fifth. Why do you love Connor Wigman despite the fact that he spells his first name incorrectly? Oh, valid point. Didn't even think that. Um, I honestly could have put him higher. Like, I think I, I think I could have justified in my own head at least putting him ahead of Jalen Milrow. Now, that would have been a little less on production and, um, and what he did last year and more of like a prediction um, of who he's going to be this next year. But I kept going back to the tape, and I kept going back to the Miami game from last year. And I get it. They lost 48-33, whatever it was. But I'm not sure if you take – any singular performance from a quarterback last year, and you'll see more big-time throws under pressure in one singular game. It was it was truly uncanny. I started just marking plays that I want to go back and maybe break down at some point, and I get like 15 deep. Like he was under fire that entire game. Back foot would hit the ground. There'd be somebody in his face within a, a second and a half, and he'd be ripping a seam right on the money in tight coverage. So I think he has all the skills, and, and that was kind of the first time, especially in that system under Jimbo, where I was like, wait a minute. They're actually kind of trying to play to his strengths. He's playing in gun. The ball's getting out of his hands quicker. They're moving pre-snap. So it's kind of like, wow, they could have something here. So he's got the skill set. He's got the demeanor. And I think now with Colin Klein and and what he's going to be able to do and actually try to make it tough on some defenses before the ball gets snapped, like I think he's going to have a massive year. And I think he's very, aside from you and me, very underappreciated and overlooked. I feel like I'm just in the back pew, just hand up, just – I'm feeling the gospel. I'm feeling it right now because I always point to that Miami game with Wigman as the the point that I really became sold on him. I thought he could become that guy, and then I thought that just brought out so many of these characteristics that you're waiting to see. And if you tell me that A&M is actually going to run pre-snap motion and oh. move guys around the full, uh, are they going to run a hurry-up offense as well? That's going to be a full-time thing and not a battle? Like, Are you telling me that's going to be the case? I, I didn't know that was allowed in College Station. It hasn't been unless Bama's been there for the last five years. It's the only time they seem seemingly cared about doing anything that would create an advantage before the snap. But to that point, too, even everyone goes back, oh, he threw two interceptions. People that just stat chase in that game, the, inter- the first interception, the dude fell down. It was actually a freaking dime that would have been right in between three defenders on a dig route the guy falls down hits the safety that's five yards behind him and then the second interception was last play of the game just throwing a dump jump ball those mean nothing like he didn't make any mistakes that game and their defense couldn't stop a nosebleed so they were in a shootout in a wet game that they just couldn't keep up with but he's got such a quick release and that game really opened up my eyes to like how accurate 
he was and how much he anticipated. Because I hadn't really seen that. Like, you knew he had a good arm. You knew he was mobile enough to make some plays. You knew he could run the RPO a little bit. But his anticipation, especially over the middle of the field, when guys were in tight coverage, that to me, I was like, okay, this is – you add that to physical traits, now you get somebody that can be special. If he can stay healthy, yeah. I do think he has all SEC type upside. What about A&M as a whole? Do you believe that A&M – should be in that 12-team playoff conversation year one of the Mike Elko era because of the fact that they have all their big games at home? Or do you still look at this team and say, nah, they're like probably going to be two, three years away? No, I think they can be in that conversation. I really do. I think they're, they're, they still have – look, you'd love to have Evan Stewart, no doubt, but they still have a lot of talent on that side of the football. Uh, Ruben Owens, I think, is a guy that's going to have a breakout year. I think Moose Muhammad's a guy that has been just on the back burner, and I think there was some – politics going on there. very much very much so he's a really good player for your third wide receiver in that group so I, I think they have a ton of talent and I think Elko is a guy that has proven that he can turn things around quickly and especially on the defensive side of the ball I don't worry about that at all but especially with this injection of Colin Klein and the thing that impressed me about Colin when you go back and watch K-State is the core concepts are always there but he game to game he did a really good job of adjusting their scheme which again is a foreign thing to me <laughs> thinking about A&M so I'm just like whoa okay you got somebody that can do that and you have the talent that A&M has always had like that's a recipe to not going to run the table but they could go nine and three ten and two with a couple big wins and a good strength of schedule and they could be in that conversation the guy that you are probably going to get the most heat about for that graphic if you read the comments which you should read all of the comments that's just I like, the way to I like reading comments. Honestly, it's it's funny, and this is you know this well. It's something that I think I, that, that that has been a maturation process in just me being on TV and in this world. Is I like I love fans that get heated about shit because that's what makes college football fun. Like if everybody just agreed and didn't want to talk shit, it wouldn't be very fun. So, are you talking about Tennessee? Of course, I'm talking about Tennessee. Why do you hate Nico Iamaleava? We have to we have to pronounce the last name every single time. We have to say it with our chest. But did you just not want to have Nico on that graphic because you thought I don't want to butcher the spelling of his last name in this email that I'm going to send to somebody in the social department? Remember now, I'm a Tennessee hater and have been forever, according to uh, X. How quickly they forget that I now looking back and regrettably so ranked. Milton like in my top three or I hated that and gave you so much crap for it you know but you know you, you win some you lose some lost that one okay admitting it um, but they quickly forget that I was real on they loved me last year they hate me this year you know Nico was interesting I kind of lumped Nico and um, Jackson Arnold together because I think they're very similar they are uber talented and I think I think Nico is going to have a massive year go back and watch that Iowa game like the thing that stood out two things he reminds me of Hennon Hooker in the way that he moves through the pocket. He's so fundamentally sound. His feet travel with his eyes everywhere he goes. So in that game, he was so accurate to the perimeter because he's just so fundamentally sound. And in those plays, I think a little bit even more so better than Hennon Hooker was able to is to really be dynamic with his feet. Hennon could get up through the pocket and hurt you. Nico can escape around the side and beat you with speed and run away from you. That's what's going to make him special. The, hes the reservation I had was just attacking the middle of the field. And, that, and that's what Tennessee couldn't do last year. That's the most important thing in this offense. I know running the football is important, pushing the ball vertical. But the reason they spread you out is to create space in the middle. And Milton couldn't hit the broadside of a barn on a slant route. And there was two or three throws a game that if he just puts it here instead of here, it's a 60-yard touchdown as opposed to an 8-yard gain or an incompletion. And if Nico can do that, sky's the limit. And he's going to be a guy that can be in that top five conversation I just wasn't ready to put him ahead of a Garrett Nussmeyer who came into an SEC championship game against Georgia and threw for 295 yards and, yeah, made some mistakes but has played in big moments, including this last bowl game. I just wasn't ready to put him ahead just based on solely projection and playing Iowa and using his feet well and being a good passer. Like He's going to be great, but obviously I hate him until I rank him number three or number two. Are you skeptical of Jalen Milrow in, in this Kalen DeBoer offense? Very. And, and I, like I say, I don't, I don't, that didn't mean any shade with that. I just have reservations about the fit, right? And that's kind of where I, I was thinking I maybe could put Connor a little higher. You know, Milrow is no doubt the worst nightmare to match up to game plan against. But when you watch Washington's film, the thing that stands out, aside from Penix just being an alien, I mean, his arm is unbelievable. Like, he's ridiculous. But how much he played on time and in rhythm. So, yes, he makes those deep throws. Yes, he gets the ball out of his hand quick. But the intermediate stuff, it's one hitch, balls out. It's back foot hits the ground, balls out. Like the glance routes, the dig routes, the, the deeper slants. Milrow 
holds on to the ball too long. And that's just that's a fact. Held on to it third longest in the entire FBS. Some of that's great because he holds on to it and can run around and make a play. Love it. But he's going to have to be able to play on time more frequently in this offense. And that's just something I haven't seen out of his game yet. And, and I just – not that he can't do it, but in this offense, you got to do it consistently because DeVore is going to ask a lot from you to keep those sticks moving through the air, not just with your feet. So that's when I go, let's wait and see. Counterpoint, if you – you played quarterback, obviously, uh, I remember. Um, you probably are at a disadvantage if you don't have a center that can snap a football. Oh what if Jalen Milrow simply has a center who snaps the football and he's the same exact player? Can I just tell you my, one of my biggest TV regrets? So we're at the Rose Bowl, and before these shows, we make these cut-ups. And usually I make three or four cut-ups, and we use two, right? I mean, we use our best. The show gets heavy, and you end up scrapping a few. I literally had made a cut-up of a bunch of snaps at Milrow's knees and how his eyes were taken away from the defense. And, and I wanted to talk about how detrimental, and it may seem like a small thing to the average fan, but how much of a nightmare it is for a quarterback. You know how hard it is to play the position, let alone now when you're doing this. And the linebacker was at five yards, and now when you look up for the second time, now he's over there at nine yards. Like, and, and it speeds everything up. So I actually I completely agree with you that if he's getting regular snaps, he's going to be much more consistent at being faster decision maker. And that was a much bigger issue than I think anybody thought it was last year. So I wish I would have ran that before the Rose Bowl because it ended up being one of the biggest plays down there at the end when he gets snapped at his ankles once again. If you were a quarterback in this league currently, let's just say that a uh, north of 30 years old Jordan Rodgers got a chance to sling the old pigskin a little bit. And if you could pick one one SEC wide receiver to be able to throw to, who would be your guy? Um, I think it would be Trey Harris for me. Oh, not Luther Burden. I was going between those two, and I'll tell you why. I only say this because he reminds me more of a Jordan Matthews. Because and I'm very humble right here. I didn't have the strongest arm. I wasn't the most accurate. So, But I'll take some chances. And if I got a guy that can – that can get up here and get one if it's a little behind or whatever it is. I just I love J Matt when I played with him because no matter where that ball was, he was going to go get it, and I trusted him and he trusted me. So it looked covered sometimes. I'd be like he's down there, I'm going to I'm going to put it on him. Trey and Jackson have that kind of relationship. Um, so Luther is unreal, and I think what's most impressive is how Kirby Moore moves him around. Everyone in the world knows where they're going with the football, and somehow they still get it to him. Um, so it, it's tough to say. I don't want to throw to Luther. I'd love to throw to Luther. But I love the bigger body type that can just go up and snag it. The Ole Miss playoff buzz, where are you at with that? Where are you at with this being a year for the ages, the type of season that Ole Miss fans have been waiting for, basically post-freeze era? I'm driving the bus. I'm telling everybody to hop on. I I think I'm very bullish on not just Jackson Dart, um, not just this offense, but the last two years, talking to Pete Golding, the thing that he kept telling us was, I just don't have the size and length I need at certain positions to run the scheme that we need to be at. And now, not that they haven't been running his scheme. They're just not all the way there. When I was at the spring event, it wasn't a game this year, uh, he's like, look, we finally have the bodies, the length I need on the back ends, on the outside, to like do this thing the right way. And I think that's what's scary about this team is that the additions that they added, that gives them – Now they're dynamic at the D-line. They're dynamic on the back end. I think Trey Amos is one of the biggest gets they got on the back end. Um, That's what's scary because I think the offense is going to be better or as good, even if they're as good. If the defense is a little better, those Alabama games maybe end up a little bit different. Those games that they came up short maybe go their way, and they're going to make a deep run because of the size they have at offensive line and the skill they have at defensive line now, I think. So what's driving the bus? Is that winning a playoff game? Is that – getting to the round of four like let's get you on record with an official prediction love that and i hadn't thought it through all the way but they're going to get to the round of four what would that mean that mean they win two playoff games or one maybe two depending on where they're at right um no i think they make a deep run into the playoffs no doubt and i would i would i'd hammer that right now 11 and 1 in the regular season for Ole Miss with a loss to georgia yeah i'm trying to think on on top of my head what's their other they have lsu at lsu um, I think you're going to be better in LSU. I think LSU is going to be better than people think too. I think LSU is going to be really good. Um, but yeah, I could see I could see 11 and one absolutely. But ju- that Georgia game I think is going to be different as well, just because of the bodies they have. I mean, that was the one game last year they really got pushed around. I don't think they're going to get pushed around. I'd still lean towards Georgia sitting right here. Um, but I think Ole Miss makes a deep playoff run. You were there for Texas getting introduced in the SEC. You got to see what the spectacle was. Pitbull in the house. 
Who got more love, you or Pitbull? <laughs> Pitbull, are you kidding me? There was one point in the end of that show where and it, it looks great on you know on Instagram when you're showing the crowd, but all their backs are turned and they're facing Pitbull. They're not looking at our stage. Looked like it did from afar. Um, but no, it's you know what I love Austin. We spent a lot of time in Austin. Had friends in Austin. Um, so I'm, I'm excited about, and I've never been to Norman, so I'm really excited about getting there too. But I think just the, the tradition, the passion fits right away, and the teams are going to have success right away despite what we think. Um, so I'm excited about it. Does JoJo root for Texas? No. So her brother went to A&M. Um, she went to Baylor. So she doesn't really root for – she roots for the Cowboys. That's about it. She's not really a college football girl. She likes to come and tailgate and have some fun, but she doesn't really have a dog in the race. Are you guys caught up on DCC? What's DCC? Dallas Cowboys cheerleaders oh, on Netflix. No, no, we're more on the Love Island right now. We go through Love Island UK and they're on the Love Island USA. You know, we're just reality TV junkies. I can't imagine you being a reality TV junkie. I've never heard of you being associated with anything related to reality TV. I just, I just love it because I'm like, I cannot believe I can did something like this. Like, what, what, what was that 27-year-old thing? I mean, very grateful, obviously, for a number of reasons. But just, like, that kid was an idiot. Somehow it all worked out. <laughs> I actually think your edit was pretty good. The only thing that was bad about your entire season was, was your hair. I, oh, just just yeah. cut the hair. Like, you, you've, you've since, you've, you've totally done the 180. You've been able to cut the hair and recognize. If you had come to ESPN, SEC Network, with hair like that, they would have said, first day, Jordan. They did. We got... They did. So here's a great behind the scenes story. So my, my second really audition um, after, because I, I had the offer and they wanted me to come in and then I told them I was doing the show and they're like, okay, we're going we're gonna to wait in case you go look like a, a jerk or something else. Um, and so when I came back to Charlotte, I literally flew from Thailand, from the finale. I've heard this story, but yeah, please tell it for our- I was tanned up and my suits though got lost. So I had a jacket and a t-shirt and my hair, if I would have pulled it down, it was probably down to here. This short on the sides, but I hadn't had a haircut in a while because we were overseas, and I just, you know, I didn't want anybody really messing it up. But, and I remember at my first meeting with Stephanie Jewelry, and she, she, like, literally the first thing she said is, this how you normally wear it? And I was kind of like, it, yeah, I mean, it may be a little trim. She's like, it's tall. And that was it. And I was like, got it. I'm vibing. I'm going to cut it. Still didn't cut it quite enough, quick enough, but we got there eventually. We're going to be in year eight of you guys yeah it's gonna be year eight you guys have been doing this since 2017 you cole and tom the great the great trio is anything new coming to the fold this year is there anything that we can we can tease that's going to be part of this because you guys are nobody's been doing this as a trio in college football longer than you guys have and i feel like you got to add something some sort of new element to it this year not just like eating a turkey leg at the state fair or whatever that was that sausage where you totally didn't become a meme or anything like that but like we got to add a new element some account in japan too by the way um unfortunately in the in the changing landscape of of college football and budgets i think it's getting harder to do really entertaining things um unfortunately one thing i'm actually excited about kind of providing insight and getting more insight from coaches on a, on a week-to-week basis is the in-helmet in- communication. Because I think the aspect that people aren't, aren't realizing is they think, okay, we're, they're going to be able to go faster, less signals. Yeah, and then Ole Miss is going to put on the brakes once you show them the defense, and Lane's going to go, hey, they're in cover two right here. Let's change this. And he's going to tell, like, when you have a young quarterback now and you can talk to them, when you go tempo and get the line of scrimmage, you got 10 or 15 seconds to say, okay, you're going to throw to this guy or this guy. They're in this coverage. Like, that's going to be fascinating to kind of see how that evolves and what teams are using it in what, what way. We're not going to be able to show maybe a ton of that, but I think just given some of that insight, I think is, is interesting and unique. Could they give you that in-helmet feed? I would. Well, they, we do that on like, uh, like XFL, UFL stuff. Um, the SEC is at the forefront. I think we're going to get to something like that eventually. Probably not the play call aspect of it. Um, I will say when I was in Tampa with Orlovsky and Glennon, I was the third string guy. So at one point I was playing receiver and defense during during the week, but I had the in-helmet communication. So I'm playing the dime safety. My roommate, Mike Glennon, is the starting quarterback. The first offense is out there, and I hear the play call. I picked it off on one of them, and I got my ass ripped because one of the coaches was like, oh, you think you're, yeah, you think you're smart? Like, <laughs> you think we don't know you know the play? Like, what are you doing? I'm like, my bad. Yeah, sorry. You're a third-string quarterback playing safety. What the hell do they want you to do? Picking my boy off because I can hear that. I know exactly where he's throwing because I heard the play. Yeah. Jeez. All right, let's get you out of here with one more. I'll let you pick. Either 
I'm not going to ask you to predict the next winner of the Bachelor or Bachelorette. We're not doing that. Um, the winner of the national championship or the Heisman Trophy, you can pick. Mm. I'm going to go Dart winning the Heisman Trophy. I think that, that, that tells me that I think they're going to – I already told you they're going to make a deep run. Um, I don't think Georgia wins the national championship this year. I, I, think I think their road during the season is tough. I think they slip up somewhere. Um, they're going to be in, in the conversation for sure. National championship, I think, is really up in the air. I'm not ready to put my name on, on one team or the other, but I think Jackson wins the Heisman. Um, Carson, I think, is still the best quarterback in the country, but they don't need him to go out and throw for 320 every game. Jackson, I think, is going to need to and be able to throw for 320, 330 every game, put up gaudy numbers. And based on their schedule and kind of what we talked about, I think if they're sitting at 11-1 and one and making a playoff run, like he's going to be right in it. The lane cockiness, if that happens, we think we've seen it. Oh, no. It's going to be on another level. Just the subtle, just the, the subtle cockiness is what I love about it because I'd probably be the same way. <laughs> I don't blame you. Jordan, this has been great. Yeah, Appreciate it as always, always, man. Thank you. Yeah. Lad of the week. Um, Will, do you mind if I start? Go ahead, man. Uh, mine's lame. I'm, I'm fully admitting that. Uh, I'm going with the last of the week. I'm going with Lauren. Mm -hmm. Deserved. Yeah, last week she was a solo parent with me at Media Days. This week, she is a solo parent just for the first part of the week. Um, just try not to get Claire sick. That's the biggest thing. Um, mm -hmm. Just don't want her to be able to, you know, if she's at home uh, throughout the week while Lauren's trying to work and Claire's sick and not able to go to daycare, that would be very, very bad news bears. Um, so, yeah, we're basically just trying to do that at this point. But I feel incredibly bad. I feel incredibly bad uh, from a guilt perspective, um, but in sickness and in health, I guess that's what that's what they say. Lauren is, I think, building up enough equity to be able to go on a two week European vacation mm -hmm. with the solo parenting at this point. Um, but yeah, I I just I feel bad the fact that I just got back from this trip. It's like, hey, you want to do some more solo parenting? Um, look forward to it tonight. I it's I knew it was bad when I was waking up. Mm -hmm. shivering in my own bed that does not happen ever to me so yeah, yeah we're uh we're powering through and uh lauren unfortunately has to bear the brunt of that by you know doing a lot of the heavy lifting so a very worthy last of the week really for two weeks here yeah man i mean she's the uh the unsung or the sung hero of the podcast, you know, doing uh, all the work that she does throughout the year. And also obviously during the season, gets a little bit lighter and, and you guys are kind of going through the, uh, you know, the new parent meat grinder too. So definitely set an example for a good, uh, for, for the listeners out there. Um, yeah, that, that's, I, just, I mean, I wouldn't feel sorry about it because you can control it. You know what I'm saying? Like it would be one thing if you were skateboarding, you know, or doing the old, like some of the stuff we hear about the NBA guys or whatever, getting hurt in the off season. But yeah, just uh, hope you feel better, man. The, uh, the, the, the challenge is that I was in Chicago for four days for my cousin's mm -hmm. funeral mm -hmm. as well. I was in Fort Myers for two days for the first part of that funeral. So like you kind of, you, you start to like add up the days that she's been doing that. It's not, it's not like I've just, you know, I'm not like going on a boy's trip or anything like that, yeah. but it's, I, I feel that guilt because I haven't been put in those spots to be a solo parent for like more than a day. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, it's just. It's guilt. I people people will know what I'm talking about. Yeah, for sure, man. Um, yeah. So quick change of direction here. I just wanted to shout out. I said I'd have kind of a better uh, lot of the week after we get done with media days. Here's some guys that just specifically like stuck out to me as just cool guys, guys that represented their programs well, right? Not that I I didn't get to talk to everybody, uh, especially on the last day. Um, but so I'm not saying there's anybody that did anything wrong or anything. But the guys that really stuck out to me. Um, so first off, the guy that really impressed me was uh, Graham Mertz. I think he was really cool. He was really real about this situation. We've seen, um, you know, quarterbacks kind of be chippy or give you non-answers. He was pretty nuanced as far as, you know, he went through, but when we joked about some of the uh, things that Billy said about gain and weight, good weight, bad weight, he actually would, he would explain that. He didn't give non-answers. Like, he actually showed me a lot from a leadership perspective. I think that Graham Mertz is, is the kind of leader you would hope to have in your team, and we'll see how much that helps uh, Florida. I think that Milrow is exactly what I thought he was. 
most super cool, super sweet. He looks at you with a big smile. You know, if you were to ask him a question or ask him whatever, he doesn't get at all confrontational. He gives really thoughtful answers. He has so much that he's been through as a player, you know, being turned into a DB or whatever by Bill O'Brien. Like he just, he's been everywhere and he has zero like resentment. He approaches everybody like they're a new person that he could make a good impact on. So really, really quality young man. Now that I'm getting older, I think Nussmeyer was awesome. Um, same deal there. He was just like, you know, leader of the program guy who, who sat down. My favorite guy that I saw, um, and and maybe not, you know, your, your favorite guy necessarily because you talked to a lot more people, but I think Taylor Green was awesome. I think Taylor Green was Agreed. my favorite guy. I think you got some really good stuff out of him talking about um, Petrino, and I'll let you kind of speak on that. But he was so pragmatic, so cool. Didn't come up with, you know, the big gold chain or anything. Not that there's anything wrong with that, but he kind of had a very, like, business-like workman mentality. He was very real about – coming in, talking to Petrino, the stuff they have left to do at Arkansas. He was – but he wasn't um, cookie cutter. Like, he wasn't just trying to get out of there. Like, he really – and like I said, uh, I'll let you kind of take up from there because you asked him a great question. I think you give you a great uh, answer about that. Yeah, basically it was uh, – I, I didn't realize that, that Petrino was his first offer coming mm-hmm. out of high school, his first offer at Missouri State. So he's known Petrino for a while. But the 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 relationship between those two is very evident. And you hear the way that that Green talks about him and how everybody, when when Petrino comes into the room, it's still the fear of God. Mm-hmm. All of those guys, Andrew Armstrong talked about this as well. They still like they they motioned the oh sit up straight. That's that's a big deal. Luke has talked about that as well. But it's it kind of goes beyond that. And he had a play the first scrimmage that they that they had. And mind you, Taylor Green won that job so early in spring camp that it mm-hmm. wasn't even. close. I mean, it was very obvious. The fact that they handpicked him in the portal, that was Petrino's guy. They made it a priority, and they said, this is the guy that we're going to go out and get. So it wasn't necessarily a surprise. But still, spring scrimmage, he gets out there, he throws across his body, and he knows that when he goes back to the sideline, he's going to hear from old Robert Patrick. Uh, And sure enough, you hear from Robert Patrick, and then you move on. But those two have a very interesting dynamic because I think it's – if it's not known within that building of what's at stake this year, I mm-hmm. think it is at least known externally about how important it is for them to be able to bounce back, to be able to extend the Sam Pittman era, what it's going to look like for Petrino, what it's going to look like for Green, a guy that has shown promise throughout his career. And I'm fascinated if he's going to be one of those guys that rises up these quarterback rankings that we do starting off as, you know, maybe, you know, somewhere between 12 and 14 or something like that. And if he's a guy that by season's end, we're saying to ourselves, man, Taylor Green is, is must see TV. And he, he and Petrino are absolutely worth watching. So yeah, just seems to be very receptive to Bobby Petrino. And I don't think everybody would be, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. <laughs> I don't think that there are, especially this day and age, we talk about how Petrino is a little bit of a throwback. I don't think he's quite as fiery as he once was. I didn't get that vibe from him, yeah. uh, or at least from players talking about him. But it's very evident that there is still this um, this aura. That's what the kids yeah. are calling it these days. This aura that, that Bobby Petrino has. And maybe it's going to be the difference in Arkansas having a bounce back season. Yeah, I think this story has definitely gone underrated. You know, and, and Taylor Green, a guy that's already won, you know, 10 games as a starter at Boise State. It's one of those situations where you need to have the job for the entire year, but he was the main quarterback they had. And so it's so interesting. Like, we'll see guys be like the guy in their conference or on their team, and they're used to winning. And they go to a situation where they got to kind of, you know, uh, tighten up the belt, put on the big boy clothes, and and not you know flex on people. And I think that Green was super humble. He was super cool. He's six feet six. He's like Thank a wiry you. guy. He said he comes from a basketball background. He used to play basketball. His family plays basketball. So really underratedly interesting guy in the SEC. Guy that like I really hope well for him. He him and that Bobby Petrino offense no matter what, is going to be great. Because, like, in terms of it's going to be entertaining, right? It's going to be entertaining because either it's going to be amazing and it's going to work great, or we're going to see Bobby Petrino on the sideline, and Taylor Green has already seen enough of that, and they, they've kind of got to have a little bit of back and forth. He's a cool, humble guy, and you got to be. you got to be a cool, humble guy to work with Bobby Petrino. Same thing that we asked for last year. We need better camera angles on mm-hmm. Robert Patrick. We need to make sure that that man is seen at all times. None of this oh, he's kind of in the shadows and you can't really get a good shot of him in the booth. No, 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 no. That was the mm-hmm. biggest disappointment from last year is that it, the the shots of Bobby Petrino, I mean, you you could have told me that was anybody and I would have not been able to, you know, differentiate between coaches. So, yeah, we need 
all all the Bobby Petrino camera angles humanly possible, especially if Taylor Green. Well, you know what? Either way, either way, because even a happy Bobby Petrino would be right. Be fun Him to smiling see. would be even better television. I don't know if I've seen that before. Yeah, I don't. What is, does he have teeth? One Do time. we know? Does Bobby Petrino have teeth? Are we sure? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Sure. Good. Yeah. Good question. Not sure. Uh, but yeah, that's going to do it. We're going to probably have, I, I'm guessing there will be something media days related that we'll still probably be discussing. Um, just things that maybe, maybe we didn't necessarily hit on yet, but uh, with our later in the week pod. So that is the, the current plan to be able to record TBD on our COVID symptoms. I say we, because you're negative as at this moment, but as of right know, now man. confirmed yeah, for my home COVID test. So we'll yes. see, we'll kind of do a time lapse. See how well, that's the cool thing. Thursday it's like coaches don't like to talk about injuries. We're questionable, you know, we'll see over <laughs> under 50 games of, uh, of college football, 25 that you will play. Oh my gosh, man. I finally got that game figured out. The AI is cheating, but we knew that boys were doing great. We're, we finally hit a groove. So I'm excited. Are you LSU right now? Right now I am. I thought I was going to be, I thought I was going to be, you know, Mr. Aragon. I started a dynasty with South Carolina. I got absolutely blitzed by Notre Dame. And I was like, hold on, I'm not good enough to do this in the highest difficulty. My D line, or my O line is getting eaten for lunch. I can't get the snap off. I just need to get some recruits in, start off somewhere I understand. So yeah, Mason Taylor Heisman. Build the program. Mm-hmm. Build it mm-hmm. up, man. It's the only way to do it. All right. Leave us a five-star review. Subscribe to our YouTube channel where you can watch every episode of the Saturday Down South podcast. Follow us on Twitter at the SDS Pod, at Set Down South, at CJ Rivera, at Go So Hard. Thanks, guys. Talk soon.